minutes. Please open the debate on the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank uh, the Minister for Justice for being uh, in the House this morning? The inspirational contribution of older people living and working across Northern Ireland is something uh, that we all as individuals and, and parties can unite around. Whether it be via volunteering, caring, employment or childcare, the roles played by this constituent group are essential to the functioning of our society. As elected representatives, we therefore have a responsibility to give older people the confidence and capacity to live enjoyable, enriched and independent lives. But the first step, Mr Speaker, must be to secure their safety in the community in which they live and in their homes. This will be even more crucial in the coming years as people continue to live longer. Currently, over 430,000 older people live in Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Statistic and Research Agency projected that by 2041, almost one in four people living in the UK will be over 65. And of course, some of us are heading towards that particular age group. So therefore, maybe we should have declared an interest before uh, speaking in the House this morning. That is why we need dedicated action to place the needs of older people at the heart of crime prevention and crime response in Northern Ireland. It is about future-proofing our crime strategy to protect the most vulnerable. The Office of National Statistics report that almost 50 per cent of over 75s live with a disability, whilst the Department of Communities estimate that around 15 per cent of people aged over 65 in Northern Ireland live in relative poverty. And while today's motion deals primarily with a law and order response to crime against older people, a cross-departmental approach is needed to address the underlying risks to our ageing population in the future, and that is to really follow on from some of the comments that were made in this House last night when there was a concern by members that there can be, also, there can be sometimes an overemphasis on the criminal justice element. But I think that you cannot be exclusive. It has to be a case of a combination of both and not a case of either or. But we want to focus around how we can bring about that cross-departmental approach. And I think in doing that, Mr Speaker, it means us facing up to stark realities of the crimes that are being committed against older people today. Crime against older people, when we start to look at the figures released by the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and I declare an interest as a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board, they highlight that in the year 2018 to 19, six percent of crime victims were aged over 65. There were 14 victims aged over 65 per thousand of the population, and 80 per cent of crimes recorded against older people related to theft and criminal damage, 16 per cent related to violence against the person. No one can begin to imagine the horrendous outcome that there are for our older people when they are attacked in such a vicious and such a cowardly way. There are gaps in relation to dealing with this particular issue. Taken at face value, these figures may not seem that high, but the interpretation loses sight of several key factors. First, the rate of crime against older people in Northern Ireland has remained consistent in the past decade, despite a reduction in traditional forms of crime. Secondly, outcome rates for crime against older persons lag roughly 2 per cent behind those of crimes against other age groups. This is despite evidence that specific crime rate targets for the elderly, which are not currently used, have led to a narrowing this gap in previous years. Thirdly, local fraud and cyber same statistics reported by Action Fraud, the National Fraud and Cyber Crime Reporting Centre are not broken down by age of complainant. There is therefore a significant gap 
in the analysis of the threat posed to older people by this form of crime. And fourthly, Mr. Speaker, the devil may well be in the detail that is not available. Underreporting a lack of dedicated provision for support for vulnerable older people in collecting evidence, barriers to witness testimony and other pressures caused by the criminal justice system. Turning to the Commissioner for Older People recommendations, Mr Speaker, ultimately these are themes that are reflected clearly in the 24 crime and justice recommendations set out in the Commissioner for Older People's report on the experience of older people in May 2019. These recommendations range from the reintroduction of specific crime rate targets and a review of existing court infrastructure to the creation of specific older people policy guidance for those working within the PPS and CPS. We in this House and the Minister for Justice should have no hesitation in endorsing them in full and I trust without delay. But in closing, Mr Speaker, I want to say that this would only be the first step. Yes, I give way. It was interesting uh, when we get into this debate, especially about uh, older people in, um, in our community and the difficulties they have. But there, there are tests and tri tested and tried uh, organisations out there, like say, Good Morning West Belfast, Good Morning Cal, and, and others uh, that provide an excellent service, and many of them underfunded, an excellent service uh, to ensure that older people within our communities uh, that have uh, some sort of contact on a daily basis. And maybe in tan and the whole crime thing that you're talking about, that that's one of the ways that we need to look at uh, and how we make life not only better, uh, but safer for older people. Would you agree? And I, I thank the member, and, and I appreciate his long involvement in his own constituency in relation to uh, knowing what are the needs of uh, his constituents. And in a, in a city setting where those particular needs are uh, particularly uh, more acute. I'm not saying that's exclusively the case, because obviously when you move into the rural areas, uh, you have other needs and other pressures and other issues. But I think that he's absolutely right. And that, that brings us back to the, the, the motive and the, the drive of the motion is about us collectively trying to see how we can ensure that we make life better for our older people. And I pay tribute to many of those organisations. I'll give way. Thank the member uh, for, for giving way. Would the member agree with me that when the statistics are recorded for a crime against an older person, indeed that the one or two people who may be involved and recorded as the uh, statistic for that crime, but in fact, where there are older persons uh, living in a community, the tsunami wave of fear that runs across that community actually creates many more victims than those who have been directly involved in the criminal act. Yeah, well, I thank uh, my colleague for making that uh, important intervention and observation. It's not just all about uh, the individual, while that is, has to be at the centre of what we do. It is also about the sense of fear that then permeates the community. And again, it comes back to the comments uh, by Mr McCann that uh, there are many other organisations who are there to help, to support and to give advice and to give reassurance to our older people. And I think, Mr Speaker, that's why in conclusion we should be innovative and outward looking in our approach to solutions. And in September 2018, the All-Parliamentary uh, Group on Financial Crime and Scamming launched an inquiry into the impact of fraud and scams on vulnerable people. It recommended that the government build on the success of the projects like the coal blocking pilot for people with dementia to address the vulnerability of older people to scammers. And this is just one example, and it is in line with what has been said by my colleague, Mr McCann, that the examples of the type of initiative that we can have here in Northern Ireland, and those initiatives ought to be explored. Mr Speaker, in concluding, we should be ambitious and flexible 
in the protections that we afford to our older generation. Crime against older people is abhorrent, and those responsible should be held to account and put where they rightly belong, behind bars. This motion and the recommendations it endorses can help to give older victims the confidence, capacity, and procedural support to make this possible. I therefore move the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to call uh, Liz Kimmins. And as this is Liz Kimmins' first opportunity to speak as a private member, I would remind the House that it is a convention that a maiden speech is made without interruption, unless, of course, the member makes controversial remarks and invites <laughs> provocation. It is my honour to stand here today as a representative for the Newry Armagh constituency. I am a very proud Newry woman, a city which is a microcosm of the island of Ireland with its unique location between Dublin and Belfast, in the valley surrounded by the beautiful mountains of Mourne and the Ring of Gullion, and controversially divided by the counties of Armagh and Down. And of course, I am an Armagh supporter. Newry is a city of very proud people, and growing up in Barcroft Park in the heart of Balabot taught me the importance of community. And I am therefore very privileged to be here today representing this community and their interests at a time when our political landscape has changed forever. I want to pay a particular tribute to my predecessor and good friend Megan Fern, who was an excellent representative for Sinn Féin and for Newry Armagh over the last eight years. Megan was a strong advocate for equality and rights and a strong advocate for her beloved South Armagh. Megan has been a role model to many and should be badly missed in elected politics, both locally and nationally, and I hope I can continue to build on her hard work. I am now delighted to be speaking in favour of this motion, and I thank the member for bringing the motion here today, a topic which I am very passionate about, following many years working with older people in the community. And it is important to note that this is not about making an assumption that all older people are weak or vulnerable but instead recognising the fact that increase in vulnerability can come with age. A significant number of older people have disabilities and mental and verbal limitations, which can increase their vulnerability and make it more difficult for them to seek help and protection. Crimes against older people can also have a more significant impact than on younger people for various reasons. Older people are less able to recover from crime, both physically and mentally, and studies have shown that victims of crime are 2.4 times more likely to enter residential care in the two years following the incident, something that many older people hope will never happen to them and, and wish to live at home for as long as they can. We have an ageing population here in the north, and it is therefore essential that the delivery of services is able to keep up with this pace of growth. There are a number of aspects of crime that impact on older people and vulnerable people. Fear of crime, as the member mentioned there, can almost be worse than the crime itself, causing increased anxiety among older people, leading to increased social isolation and subsequently resulting in the onset of illness. Many older people live alone, and their main social interaction is dependent on others coming into their home to provide the support and assistance they need. And in my experience, on many occasions, the perpetrators of crimes can be someone in a position of trust, be it a carer, family member or a close friend, who have an opportunity to abuse their position. Therefore, it is also essential that in implementing the recommendations that we consider how we can reduce the possibility of abuse in these situations by avoiding isolation by dependency on others. And as raised by my colleague here, uh, Mr McCann, there are invaluable services out there in the communities that we need to be supporting. In my own constituency, we have the Good Morning, Good Neighbour Scheme, the Home Secure Project, and many, many other community initiatives that are invaluable to the older people in our society. And it's important that we ensure that they receive sufficient funding and are able to develop on the good work that they're already doing. As well as this, in my own council area, the Newry Morning Down PCSP have done significant work around fear of crime and crime prevention in response to a spate of burglaries in recent times providing home safety packs and beat the burglar kits to older people, holding crime prevention events and information sessions in local community centres and town centre locations. And there has been a huge uptake for these because of the significant rise in crime over that period. This work needs to be further developed and rolled out across the north if we are serious about reducing fear of crime and building the confidence of older people and helping them to feel safer in their own homes. Older people face many more challenges to accessing justice than younger people typically, and the recommendations in the report have highlighted these. 
PSNI statistics between 2008 and 2018 have consistently shown that lower outcome rates for older people who are victims of crime. And this can be for a number of reasons. For example, reluctance to report to PSNI due to lack of confidence in the system, possibly past experiences where there hasn't been good outcomes when they've reported crime. Or fear of repercussions. As I've already mentioned, there may be, uh, these can be particularly pertinent where the perpetrator is known to them, be it uh, someone who's coming to their home on a regular basis, a family, if it's a family situation, or a close friend. For example, where there may be financial abuse. So as the member has already said, there's a lot of under-reporting and it's important that we do all we can to encourage that people feel safe and confident to report these to the right authorities. Many cases see no real outcome and this can decrease confidence in the system. It is therefore important that we agree to instruct the policing board, which I declare that I am a member, bring your members your <laughs> to, close, please. to reintroduce specific outcome rate targets, which I believe will help to improve outcomes, especially for older people, and enhance transparency and effectiveness of the justice system. In recent times, we have also seen a high number of scamming incidents where older people have been specifically targeted. And in these cases, many older people can often feel embarrassed, about, which can make them more reluctant to report to the police. Member Nisa Wender, remarks, please. Okay. In addition to these factors, as previously mentioned, a significant number of older people have disabilities, physical and mental communication difficulties and sensory issues, all of which it can make it difficult to access justice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member. Okay, I would like to call Sinead Bradley. Mr. Speaker, um, firstly, I welcome the opportunity to support this motion and I commend both Mervyn Story and Joanne Bunting for bringing it forward. At the outset, I'd like to reassure any older people listening in that following a spate of burglaries that we were all aware of in 2011, the rate of recorded burglaries, burglaries for those aged 60 and over has dropped significantly by 28%. There was, however, a negative legacy of these earlier incidents, and that has remained with many. And as rightly been pointed out, there are now people living with victims of fear of crime as opposed to actual crime. And the consequential loneliness that emerges from this issue should not be lost. It is a real blight on society. I'd like to congratulate the Commissioner for Older People on the very thorough 2019 report, which has been referred to in the motion. And of course, it focuses on the views, looking at it purely from the older person's perspective. But on inspection of the recommendations proposed and the safeguards that could apply to many vulnerable people in our society, regardless of their age, and in that I'm thinking more of people with learning disabilities, uh, people with physical disabilities and children. In that same vein, the Department Sentencing Review of 2019 quite correctly stated, before considering options for change, the review considers it important to clarify the category or categories of victims requiring extra protection. The debate to date has focused rightly on older people, but this excludes other vulnerable people and it has proved difficult to define what is meant by an older person. I know some, many sprightly over some things who would take great offence at being called old or, at least, or even vulnerable. Uh, the 2019 report rightly, uh, by the uh, Commissioner of Older People rightly highlights the barriers that exist to justice and they arguably apply more to older people and vulnerable members of our society. They have been touched on today. Some of them are that reluctance to give evidence in court. The offender may be known to the victim or they're conscious that the offender knows where they live. There is a delay in realizing that crime has actually happened and that is particularly true when we think of scamming or financial abuse. Or the, the victim may be embarrassed to report it. Also, there is a real impediment in the length of time to progress through the justice process. It's very consuming during what should be a very precious time in somebody's life. No doubt there is a need for a review of the court infrastructure to better facilitate the needs of those vulnerable older people and vulnerable groups across society. When we hear reports of violence against an older person, all right-thinking people are sickened and disgusted. But it also gives rise to our very innate human instinct to protect. 
And today this motion rests much of that with the minister in asking her to take up her role in safeguarding these vulnerable groups of people we are talking about. Going forward, Minister, we must entrust, safeguard and reassure our older and vulnerable people, empower them to report crime and engage with as much comfort as possible with the justice system, to ensure they remain empowered and supported at the end of the process, and to see justice served. The whole process will... I will indeed. Where I live in West Tyrone, in fact, many of those people that you talk about uh, are the, the, the vulnerable and the elderly are living in very, very isolated communities and the likes of it as well too. And that the police have already informed us that it's organised crime on an all-Ireland basis that is subjecting these people to the sort of continuous robberies that have happened in our area. And that they also acknowledge that it requires an all-Ireland response to it, that where they need close cooperation with the PSNI and the Garda Shikana. And uh, I would have hoped maybe that, uh, that in, in this motion that as well, too, that's recognised that it is on that all-Ireland basis that it needs to be responded to in many respects for the isolated people and communities that I live in. I accept the member's point and I, I concur. And living in South Down, a predominantly rural constituency that borders the region, I think everybody will share the view in the House that any perpetrator of this crime should have no place to hide on this island or any island, and systems should be cognizant of that. The, ho the whole process, however, will be valued by that final piece. When sentencing is determined, sentencing must take recognition of the extraordinary courage required from a vulnerable person who has stepped up to engage with the justice system and process. And that must also reflect the absolute disgust that exists within society of the heinous acts that are often behind the stories of older abuse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, can I congratulate the, the member for her maiden um, speech? Uh, five minutes goes past pretty quickly, um, but I look forward to, to, to many more uh, in the coming weeks and, uh, and months. Uh, I stand to support this motion, uh, and, and why would you not? Um, as a society, if we do not protect uh, our older people, then, then, then we have serious questions to ask ourselves. And I thank the member for bringing uh, this motion forward. Um, it is the third motion in regards to. Um, crime that we've debated in the last uh, three days and I fully understand because it's been made w uh, well made that the perpetrators um, are affected by social economic issues with poverty with mental health with drug uh, and alcohol abuse problems and some of the perpetrators are actually victims themselves and I get all that but I absolutely make no apologies whatsoever to stand and champion the victim and that's what I want to do. I want to stand and I want to champion the victim. But I fully get that this is a cross-departmental issue. Because here is the reality. Um, the reality is that 52% of old, older people fear being a victim of crime. 52%. In my own council area, 45% fear becoming victims of crime. And I know Johnny and, and Dolores um, will be shocked by that. Uh, and they will be taking steps as I am. It's an incredible number. But here's where it's even worse. 30% of older people fear abuse, intentional acts or failure to act by a caregiver or another person in a relationship involving an expect expectation of trust. What are we saying is that 30% of the people in our society, the older people in our society, are afraid of being victims of crime through a relative, a trusted person, or a caregiver. And there's something insidious about a society that has that level of fear in our older people. If we need to look for an example of that, we need look no further than Muckamore Abbey and what's going on there. Truly, truly shocking. The police have identified 1,500 crimes against older people on one ward alone. 50 reports of assault, 
against older people between 2014 and 2017. And we know this is an ongoing investigation, but they are shocking figures. And if they are not a wake-up figure, then there's something really wrong with us in this House today. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. A very point the member makes about Montgomery Abbey, which is my constituency. Would the member also be shocked that I have written to the Chief Executive of the Trust uh, in relation to a case of a patient who is currently there, and the parents are concerned about that case, and they're reluctant for us actually to have a meeting to discuss that case over fears of the family? Uh, I, I, I thank the member for, for his, uh, his question. Uh, and you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not shocked anymore. I'm not shocked this is going on, that people are just a, a kind of ignoring it or trying to shuffle it under the, under the carpet, but I'm really, really saddened by what's going on in the state of our society today uh, and our older people and, and, and how they are being abused. And that's what it is. Society is abusing our older people. If we look at older people who are being scammed out of the money that they work for, one in four of our older people, one in four of our older people are victims of a scam, losing about 10% of them losing up to £1,000 because of that scam. Now, there was a sentencing review um, which ended, I think, last month. It might have been, it might have been January, I'm not quite sure. But, but it ended. Um, and, and Chapter 9 uh, of that sentencing review dealt with older people. And it asked questions about how we should look at the punishments for those who abuse or or, or are violent against those older people. And without a, a doubt, there is a, uh, no question that there's a public anger that our older people are being uh, abused. And then the question is, and if you go to, I think it's question, question number 54, they ask, should there be a new offence? A new offence of assault on a vulnerable person by virtue of their age or other factor. And I know, Kelly, you mentioned other vulnerable people, and I, and, and, and I know I'm just dealing with older people here. And the answer is absolutely there should be. There must be an offence against older people because they are so vulnerable. And I think and I hope that that review reflects the anger of society and says that older people do deserve a certain type of protection that they don't presently get in our society. We're all going to be old at some stage. Some of us will already say that I'm old. My children say that I'm already old. Um, but it's not about us growing up. It's about those who are there now. And we must take action to protect those people. Therefore, this is a good motion. It is the right motion. It's a motion we all have to support. But more than that, it's a motion that must result in some form of action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to Mr. Story and Ms. Bunting for bringing forward the motion this morning. As someone who has worked with older people, I'm grateful that a focus on crime and the effect of crime on older people is being debated today. The motion highlights the report compiled by the Older Persons Commissioner, Eddie Lynch, and confirms being a victim of crime can be a traumatic experience for anyone, but there are particular consequences for older people. As I said, I worked with older people before. Um, I can give an example of an older lady who was blind, who unfortunately was known to have kept 200 pounds in her house. And lo and behold, one day, two young people arrived at her door, purporting to be from the milkman, and stole her 200 pounds. While that was a terrible event that happened to her, she did not leave her house for six months afterwards for fear that it was going to happen again. While it is true that crime against older people is thankfully rare, the fear of crime is significant within older people. In 2018-19, there were four crime victims aged 65 or over per thousand of the population. 12 per thousand were victims of burglary, 12 per thousand were criminal damage, and three per thousand were uh, violence against the person. So while the crime levels can be low, we have to be very careful that today's debate does not exacerbate the fear that happens. And it's been spoken about before, the reverberations, the ripple effect does have huge implications. The report of the Commissioner for Older People had a number of recommendations that I believe have been taken up and are making significant progress to help older people. The report highlights a number of contributory factors for lower crime rates, crime rates for older people, including delays in reporting crimes because of embarrassment or delayed realisation that a crime has occurred. 
Support for older people to report is key, and I wish to highlight the excellent work of the Support Responders Service in Ards and North Down. It was launched in December 2018 and then revised and looked at again in December 19 and still runs today. It provides immediate, practical and emotional support to older people when they have become a victim of crime. This type of service helps older people after a crime has happened and encourages others to know that when their friend has reported a crime, that they, will, they have received report, um, support through that process and therefore they will receive support through that process. But there are wider issues of how we take proactive steps to help older people feel safer in their homes and community and this is why the role of PCSPs is so important. One positive PCSP initiative is the Belfast Home Security Service that provides home security. We've all seen them. They're the door chains that are there. They're the fake beans cans that you can hide in your house. Um, and that helps people who have been recent victims of domestic burglary and also help people who feel vulnerable that they may become a victim of crime and help them to feel more secure in their homes. This service is aimed at people over the age of 60 um, and the PSNI crime prevention officers undertake assessments of a house and makes recommendations for home security equipment. Um, and when that is being fitted, other support services can also be signed, posted. And similar schemes, for instance, in my local village of Clahey, tiny wee place, that provides, they provided door chains and a good neighbour scheme. They were afraid of the neighbourhood um, schemes that you see around, so they set up a good neighbour scheme. The result of that has been to build confidence and community cohesion to help defeat that fear. Another recommendation raised by the report was having pre-recorded cross-examinations. And I'm encouraged that the Department of Justice is exploring the introduction of pre-recorded cross-examinations in order to improve the experience of victims who have had to give evidence at court, meaning that vulnerable victims could give their evidence ahead of trial and outside the courtroom. Not having to attend the trial should reduce the stressful impact on the victim, as well as hopefully improving the quality of their evidence as a result. And I look forward to hearing from the Minister and the further activities and action, actions she intends to bring forward. But Mr Speaker, before I take my seat, I would like to raise an issue about how we treat older people in society. The measurement of respect and inclusion is how we treat our most vulnerable people. The Human Trafficking and Exploitation Criminal Justice Support for Victims Act Northern Ireland 2015 defines a vulnerable person as a person aged 18 or over whose ability to protect himself or herself from violence from violence, abuse or exploitation is significantly impaired through physical or mental disability or illness, old age, addiction to alcohol or drugs or for any other reason. Yet, in society, we hear of nursing homes and residential homes closing down or evicting older people from their home with no consideration of where they will go to live. We have all heard the terrible stories of abuse that have happened in residential homes for older people. Yes, certainly. Thank the member for giving way and on the point and I note what Mr Beattie has said as well about the duty upon us to look after those in care but would you join with me in recognising the many caregivers within uh, homes, residential homes and care homes that do a fantastic service looking after our elderly whenever they are at their most vulnerable? And I thank the member. Um, I'm actually just going to come to that point as well. As well. And I say, uh, following on from that, while not all homes employ abusers, what systems do we have in place to prevent abusers from going to work with older people? The Access NI system has worked well to stop people from working with children, but what about older people? We also treat those who care, as the member has pointed out, for or, or older people, for our vulnerable people, as unskilled. These are the people who we entrust to look after our mums and our dads, our grandparents. Did the member and start withdrawing her remarks, Bildy. please. They're allowed to go into homes for 15 minutes. We must do better. We see now that the Pensioners' Parliament has been closed down. We must do so much more to give people voices. With an ageing society living longer, we should not be allowing older people to Member's live in fear, dismissed or as an annoyance. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Member. I call uh, Paul Given. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank my colleagues, Mr Storey and Ms Bunding, for bringing forward the motion? Uh, and can I thank and put on record our appreciation to Eddie Lynch, the Commissioner for Older People, uh, who commissioned this report, the first of its kind, uh, into uh, crimes against older people and vulnerable people and their experiences. And it's a very uh, worthwhile uh, document that was produced. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that in this review, uh, the, uh, Dr Kevin Brown, lecturer in criminal law and criminal justice at Queen's University, who conducted the research 
This is what he said. The research has shown that older victims of crime find it more difficult to access justice in Northern Ireland. Urgent reforms are needed to provide better support for older people when they journey through the justice uh, system. That's a warning that we need to heed. It's a warning that the Justice Minister needs to heed. And those 24 recommendations that were made across the different agencies within the criminal justice system need to be implementing. When we look at the experiences of some of those older people, there's a recognition that it's a much more traumatic experience for them than it is uh, for other members of the population that uh, endure crime against them. All crime's wrong. The experience that that inflicts in them uh, is something that those individuals have to bear. But for older people, there's particular aspects to it because they're in greater fear of crime. Mr Beatty referenced that. Uh, they have less support structures often in place than other people uh, younger, uh, often living alone in isolation. And so the trauma that they go through is something uh, that we must recognise and this report highlights. Yes, older people are less likely to be a victim of crime. But I would caution against members that say that it's rare, because that sometimes can lead to people not focusing on this issue when it needs to be focused upon. The figures show uh, that there were approximately around 5,000 attacks on people uh, over the age of 65. That's not rare. That's far too high. Wholly unacceptable. And I wouldn't define it as a rare incident whenever these happen, because unfortunately it's not rare. It's far too common. And so we need to have that serious laser-like focus, what needs to be done uh, to reduce that level of crime against uh, older people. Members have touched upon different aspects uh, in respect to it, and I just wanted to pick up on the, the sentencing review Mr Beatty referred to. It. I would commend it to members. Uh, it closed in February in terms of the consultation. Uh, there's a section on it on, on older people, and it gives a, a number of areas just to look at. And one is that Currently, we don't have a specific offence for attacks on older people. Uh, we have within the court system guidance where it's to be taken into account as an aggravating factor, uh, and then sentencing should reflect that by the judiciary. And if it's unduly lenient, it can be referred to the Court of Appeal. But there have been uh, incidences where that has had to happen because of unduly lenient sentences. Uh, so should we go down the route of minimum sentencing, which is something this place has debated, uh, on two separate occasions, we had legislation brought forward in 2015. The House didn't accept it when it came to minimum sentencing, and I can understand some of the arguments at the time around that. But I think, interestingly, the Scottish Review is looking at putting in place that aggravating factor for attacks on older people on a statutory footing. That would then require the judiciary to say, did we take it into account? Why was it then not taken into account whenever the sentencing was there? And it forces the judiciary to record the reasons for it. I often find whenever you have to record your reasons for something, it makes you just a little bit sharper when it comes to reaching your determination. So I think that's something that I would be interested in, in exploring further. Des Marin and, and his uh, hate review uh, uh, scheme that he's currently undertaking, he also was looking uh, at adding uh, age as something that should be added to a specific uh, issue around hate crime. And I think that's something that, uh, as well, we need to give due consideration to. There's a whole number of different aspects that we can look at around hate, um, uh, but age is one of them that is being act actively considered, and I think that that has merit in doing it. Sinead Bradley made uh, important comments as well about defining vulnerability, uh, and I think that is a, an issue because the Pensioners' Parliament did not just say it is specific to age, and it is difficult just to, to put down, is it at 65, is it at 70, but the key aspect here was vulnerability. Uh, and uh, Ms Armstrong referenced that the 2015 Human Exploitation Human Trafficking legislation defines what it is to be vulnerable. And I think there is merit in having a consistency of approach across, the crimin across legislation around close. vulnerability. So I think these are aspects that we should look at. I commend the motion, and I trust that it will get the support of this House. Uh, thank you. And I now call Orlea Flynn. And just to remind the House that it is this Orlea Flynn's first opportunity to speak as a private member. I would remind members that it is a convention that a maiden speech is made without interruption. Thank you. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate and address this House. Ironically, on this day, the 3rd of March 2017, I was making an acceptance speech on behalf of Alex Maskey, Pat Sheehan, Fran McCann and I 
as we were re-elected to the West Belfast constituency by almost 25,000 voters in the last Assembly election. I have been an MLA for over three years, and this is the first opportunity I have had to address this House. I will not rehearse the reasons why, but I am happy to say progress has been made, and that I, like many other members here, wish to make a real difference to the lives of the people of West Belfast and wider afield. As this is my first speech, I would like to take a few moments to acknowledge the great work and example of my predecessor, Jennifer McCann. I am proud to follow and replace Jennifer McCann as an MLA and as a proud Irish Republican woman. I look forward to representing the people of the Colin area just as well as Jennifer did. For those who know me, you will know I have a keen interest in mental health, suicide prevention and women's health care issues, particularly the ongoing mesh implant scandal, which has seen so many women injured by these devices. I have had the pleasure and the privilege to work with so many great individuals, campaigners, groups and families. I won't name them, as I know even if the Speaker indulges, it will nearly be impossible to cover them all. Within the past three years, as Sinn Féin mental health spokesperson for the North, I have worked closely with my colleagues in the South, Mara Devine and Pat Buckley. And I would also like to acknowledge the genuine relationships and cross-party working that I have experienced since becoming an MLA and chair of the All-Party Group on Suicide Prevention. I want to express my appreciation to the members in this chamber who sit on our all-party group and who have worked collectively to try and tackle the issue of suicide. However, returning to the motion at hand, I welcome the fact that in May 2019, the Commissioner for Older People published a report calling for change in how older victims of crime experience the criminal justice system. And it is my understanding there are several recommendations that have yet to be fully implemented. Older people should be able to participate fully in the criminal justice process to have their voices heard. A review of the existing court setup should ensure that the needs of all older people are provided for. I believe an enhanced collaboration working approach by relevant agencies is needed. An example would be the rollout of the support hubs, which would bring together key professionals to support victims of crime. From my work in mental health, I see a lot of talk about the need to support younger people with access to the internet and social media, but is there the same emphasis on older people and internet use? It is important for older people to become more protective over their personal and financial details, as statistics show that fraudsters have targeted one in five pensioners here in the North. Crimes such as burglary, vehicle theft, criminal damage and violence without injury intrude on personal space. This invasion of safe spaces can cause severe and lasting harm. Almost half of our older people, as already been mentioned, um, feel more fearful of becoming a victim of crime compared to two years ago. We don't want a situation where older people are locking themselves away in their own homes through fear of being victims of crime. They may not let neighbours into their house for fear of another burglary. They may stop driving to the shops or to visit friends because they fear their car being stolen. This can be the unforeseen impact of crime. Being a victim of crime can be a traumatic experience for anyone, but again, as already been said, there are particular factors that make older people more vulnerable. We have heard of some of the examples already within the chamber, um, within the, the care home setting, um, and as members will know, the De Murray Manor care home, which is within my own constituency, is also the focus um, of a police investigation into the alleged abuse of elderly res residents. But all and any form of crime can have a devastating and lasting impact on our older people, both physically and mentally. The fear of crime can be so damaging to an older person's state of mind and seriously hinder their level of social interaction. Studies have shown that isolation is a key influencer to the onset of illness and to the fear of crime can result in such isolation. The report highlights um, it is often the case that the support networks older people once enjoyed are not as robust as they previously were due to friends and family members passing away. When we are seeing the demographic changing and our older population significantly increasing, it should be a cause for celebration. However, it also means that we need to rethink how our public services are set up and how they deliver for their needs. The criminal justice system should be no different. It must be accessible to older people and, importantly, must deliver for older people. Therefore, I call on the Assembly to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Paul Frew. Mr. Speaker, and I rise to commend the motion on the, my colleagues, Mervyn and Joanne, for bringing it here today to discuss this very important topic. And again, I will repeat the fact, because I think it is important, that we have debated three motions 
about crime. And I think that tells us something about where our members are, their psyche, and how they have the pulse of the communities for which they represent. And, and that's a good thing that we can debate it here. Um, and yes, I, I, I would like to put on record my thanks to Eddie Lynch, the Commissioner for Older People for Northern Ireland, uh, in conducting the report, the first report of its kind, uh, to shine a light on this very important issue. We all have loved ones. We all have loved ones who are getting older, and we all recognise the vulnerabilities as we do get older. Uh, and I think we recognise the fact that as we get older, we worry about things more. And that's certainly true uh, for people probably at the higher age range of over 75s, maybe living alone, maybe living in an isolated uh, farmhouse somewhere out in the country in a big long lane. And there's absolutely no doubt their age creates a vulnerability that we probably don't, won't actually understand, but we, we need to. And I have no doubt that those people who are vulnerable, elderly, isolated, are targeted. They actually become a target for criminals. And that's the reason why I agree with comments made today about, about having some sort of sentence that, that actually identifies the vulnerability. And whilst we have aggravated factors, I think we need more. I think we need something stronger. Uh, and the opportunity is there. The opportunity is there through the sentencing review of Northern Ireland that the previous minister had launched. And just when I'm on my feet and I, 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 I remind myself of this, can I commend Claire Sugden's comments last night when she talked about and she uh, related to the, previous, the current minister and that the Department of Justice really is a department for failure. And she wasn't being derogatory about that to the department. She was basically meaning that this needs to be more joined up because ultimately if it's not joined up, then the Department of Justice has to deal with it. So I hope out of the sentencing review, uh, something will come out that will protect elderly people because of the vulnerability that they have because of their age and isolation. And there's also something true in this, and that is the length of time it takes for court case, first of all, to materialise, but then also to get extended out to, to an outcome. And that's something that has, we have been grappling with as a society for a long, long time. And it's something we need to be cognizant of. The length of time it takes to bring things to court and to actually get them out the other end. Also, the officialdom of court. It's really scary when you have to step in to a courtroom. Some of us have experienced it. Some of us won't, hopefully not ever. But it's a very scary thing, much more so for somebody who is vulnerable, someone who is elderly, someone who doesn't understand it, maybe gets confused. And that's why I think, looking at the report from Eddie Lynch, the Commissioner for Older People, when he, when he issues the recommendations five and six, six in particular talks about an advocacy scheme for, for older people, I think that's something that should be looked at seriously. And me being on the Committee for Justice, I know the Chair has alluded to this, I think that we need to make sure and ensure that... Yes, I will. Yes. Would you accept uh, that maybe advocacy is not always the right thing? It's some actual things with substance. I mean, I can think of my own mother uh, and the person at the kitchen table and me saying to her, why, why is that purse there? And she said, in case somebody breaks in. And it's more about communities and actually getting somewhere and bringing our older generation together and somewhere they actually feel safe in their homes as opposed to being feeling vulnerable. I mean, advocacy sometimes can be seen as talking shops. Yeah, thank uh Thank the member for intervention. Of course, yes, and, and I think there has to be some sort of educational uh, scheme whereby we as family members can help uh, alleviate the fear of crime. But the advocacy service will be for when, a victim, when there has been a victim of crime, and we need to wrap and support uh, ourselves around that victim and, and, and see, see through the process that they are now in, not of their choice or making. But we also realise that when vulnerable people are attacked, it's sometimes and most times burglary. 
where people invade your space, where people invade your home, and sometimes wreck it, but nonetheless leave that person vulnerable in their own home where they would have nightmares, they don't want to stay in their own home. That is catastrophic for people. And I know of loved ones, I know of elderly folk who have never recovered from that crime, never, ever recovered, and their health has failed because of it. That is something we should not tolerate, we should not abide, and we should do everything in our power to, to reduce this crime, criminality, and to take these people off our streets and put them in prison where they belong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Um, before uh, we proceed, I will be calling the Minister to respond at 11.37, and there are several people listed. Members are entitled to use their full five-minute allocation, but I would encourage them to be generous with other members because there's a significant number of people who still want to get in and we're now into a very limited time. So I call Ms Catherine Kelly. Older people are the backbone of our communities. They are our parents and grandparents. They are our neighbours and friends. Their homes may once have been filled with the busyness of their children. There was security in that. Now they may be completely alone, leaving them vulnerable and lacking in social support that younger people can avail of. Many years ago, not long after my grandfather passed away, my grandmother was the victim of burglary in her own home. With that came an intense fear and vulnerability that was not present beforehand. It took a very long time before she felt safe again, especially as those who broke into her home never faced the justice system. Therefore, we are supporting this motion and I welcome the recommendations in the Crime and Justice Report from the Commissioner for Older People and the progress to date on the implementation of some of the recommendations with more work still to be done. In evaluating and implementing the remaining recommendations, the focus must be on prevention, early intervention and improving outcomes for victims. It is paramount that we do all we can to help reduce fear of crime for older and vulnerable people and to increase their confidence and feeling of safety in their own homes and communities. Especially older people living in rural areas who are more at risk of isolation and where PSNA resources are stretched. Crucially, they need to feel empowered and confident that they can access justice without delay. I believe education is key here in ensuring that older and vulnerable people can feel confident that they have, no have the knowledge to do all they can to secure themselves and their homes from criminals. They need to be aware of provision of ongoing prevention advice on everything from burglary to internet crime, information on what to expect from the police and details of organisations that support older people who may feel fearful. Older people must be self-assertive and their ability to make use of simple crime prevention advice if and when needed. As our older population continues to grow, we need to ensure our delivery of service and justice system are fit for purpose. With the support of a de departmental and cross-agency plan, implementing all recommendations will improve the workings of our criminal justice system and better aid old, older people who are victims of crime or at risk of becoming victims of crime. Thank you. I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, for your last young call. Thanks very much, Mr. Prince of Deputy Speaker. And I'll try to, to be brief here. I think much of what, what I'll say has already been said, so I don't want to run the risk of reiterating that. Uh, nevertheless, um, we have to pay reference to the, the older people in our society uh, who have made a contribution, <coughs> who have been there through, through good and bad times, and deserve the right to live in peace in their own homes. Uh, the, the valuable work uh, produced by the Commissioner for Older People is, is indeed very useful to us and gives us a benchmark as to how uh, different organisations should be rolling out their projects and maybe engaging that bit better. Uh, nevertheless, one of the things I, I would like to emphasise, lest it go out from here today, that older people are more susceptible to crime. The, the reality is that older people are less likely to be the victims of crime. And I think that that reassurance and that message must go out as well. Uh, however, in relation to burglary, criminal damage, vehicle theft and violence without injury, there is a lower outcome rate for older people than other age groups, and that is contained in the, the, the very useful research that has been provided to us by Assembly Research here today. Now, I think that does need to be looked at. 
<clears throat> there are 24 recommendations in the Commissioner for Older People's report. Some of those I'll just highlight, if I could, please, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. The recommendations, especially that data should be broken down by demographic characteristics, and um, uh, Melissa McHugh did refer to some isolated rural areas. I would represent areas like that too. So it would be very useful to hear that. Roving criminal gangs, some of which come up from the Midlands in the part of the country, uh, they have been in around South Derry and have been breaking into older people's houses too. Uh, the member way. Yep. Sure. I appreciate uh, the member giving way. Will the member then share with me, given the cross-border nature of the crime, the uh, decision of the British government to drop the European arrest warrant uh, in terms of its uh, commitments to Europe, and also share with me the Chief Constable's con concern that there is no updated uh, community safety uh, programme for Northern Ireland. The last was published in 2012. I think Members are entitled to an extra minute. Well, I am not going to take it. So, Good man. Uh, they um, will be very brief uh, in saying that those are two very, very useful points, and perhaps the Minister could reflect those in her response. Uh, the need for the DOJ to engage with the Commissioner for Older People on these recommendations, the PPS and its requirement uh, to look at the issues of adopting similar approaches to the Crown Prosecution Service of flagging up cases, flagging those cases up as crimes against older people. That is particularly useful and important. The, the PSNI and PPS training is a very important recommendation too. And um, of course the, the issue of a higher no prosecution rate for crimes involving uh, complaints against 75 plus in comparison to other age groups needs particularly to be drilled down into, and that is that's a requirement. Um, a pilot scheme is a recommendation on the introduction of pre recorded cross examination and re examination to be introduced. That too is very valuable, along with the, the recommendations about the judiciary, about criminal justice practitioners, and indeed the, the PSNI requirement to conduct an audit of human equipment resources and the court infrastructures too. <clears throat> However, um, what we have is some very, very valuable projects within our own constituencies. For example, Agewell in Marfelt um, conducts almost 500 calls each morning to vulnerable and older people. That is vital. The handyman services that they have, the installation of key services for the access of home care workers, for example, and two, this is a, a vital element for many, many older people. The role and function of those domiciliary care works is integral. It is a lifeline for them. And I think maybe more tic-tac between the statutory agencies at that level would be important. And, and of course, yeah, very briefly, yeah. And I think it makes a very valid point, because the difficulty is sometimes there is little coordination or crossover between those very organisations, whether it is a call provision or the domiciliary care, and certainly that cross-departmental uh, work would be something which would be very valuable. Thank the member for that. And one last point, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, a duty upon us all, and that is to be uh, a good neighbour, uh, and to keep an eye out for. We all know them living in our communities, particularly rural areas. To keep an eye out for those older people who are living alone, sometimes in isolation, just to keep a watchful, not a nosy or intrusive eye, but a watchful eye out for them. Thanks very much. Thank you. I call Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Being the victim of crime can be a disturbing and distressing experience for any person, particularly if it impacts on their health, either emotionally and or physically. With this dreadful experience being further compounded, if the victim perhaps is from an older age group or a more vulnerable person. We have all watched and listened to many elderly people who have been subjected to crime. Who will, who will ever forget that elderly lady from Ochnacloy in my own constituency of Fermanagh and South Tyrone who jumped from an upstairs window after her home was broken into? Crime comes in many different guises. We have crime that involves violence against the person, crimes of property including theft and burglary, cybercrime, telephone scams and internet scams. At the Northern Ireland Pensioners Parliament, in a survey conducted by Age Sector Platform in Northern Ireland, two years ago it was found that the fear of crime was a major concern for two out of three, 64 per cent. Yes? 
there needs to be more work done, particularly in terms of bringing older people and younger people together. And some PCSPs in an all my own area, youth services do some really good work in relation to that, and I think there needs to be more of that. Members entitled to an extra minute. Yes, I would agree. This intergenerational work is excellent and works well. We see it in schools happening at the moment between the older people and the younger people. Yep. Um, <clears throat> half of these older people in Northern Ireland have become more fearful as they grow older of falling victim to crime. Of particular concern was the crime of burglary, within, with one in six adults worrying about being the victim of that crime and 13% expressing concern about violent crime. Many claimed that this high level of fear of crime impacted detrimentally upon their quality of life. They imagined they were being watched when they were leaving their home and actually feared returning home, not knowing what one would discover. While society totally condemns crime against older people, each incident in further traumatises the victim and increases fear among the wider population. Unfortunately, a lack of confidence in the statutory agencies, including the Public Prosecution Service, has done little to allay the fear of crime with these people. The length of time a case can take to get to court, the types and lengths of sentencing imposed in cases of burglary and assault on our vulnerable population must be reviewed to gain back the confidence of these elderly people. In trying to assist with bringing the perpetrators to account, many older people claimed they found the experience of appearing in court daunting, while the progression of failing physical health and memory recall caused problems in trying to bring about prosecution, especially if the case was taking too long to progress. With the fear of crime increasing and solved crimes well below acceptable levels, something must be done to reassure our elderly. Measures must be taken to lessen their chance of falling victim. These people must feel safe in their home, whether it be from thugs that enter their home to commit violent attacks, steal or commit, commit sexual assaults, or so-called trusted friends responsible for financial abuse, or fraudsters calling at their homes and charging exorbitant fees for minor repair work or someone preying on those vulnerable people through threatening phone calls and scams on the internet. While all of these crimes can have a devastating impact through financial loss, physical scars, and emotional well-being, sadly, others choose to try and forget the experience because of the embarrassment of admitting that they have become a victim of crime. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is essential, therefore, that our elderly population, that have still so much to offer their families and society, are treated with dignity, listened to and protected. A renewed effort must be made to keep these people safe in our community. I support the motion. Thank you. Um, I will call Mr. Gordon Dunn, but would remind him he has about two and a half minutes. So, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to speak on this matter. Thank my colleagues for bringing forward this important issue today. The impact which crime has upon our older population cannot be underestimated, and the Commissioner for Older People's Report, launched in 2019, certainly reinforces the need for action on this issue and provides an extensive series of recommendations to improve the experience of older people across Northern Ireland. Although overall, Older people are less likely to be victims of crime. The impact that crime may have on their lives can be truly devastating. And having assisted older victims of crime through my constituency work over the years, the mental and physical trauma that crime can have on older people is very serious and can lead to real isolation, vulnerability and the loss of independence. It is important that there's a focus on speeding up of justice and also consideration given to the introduction of screens in court pre-recorded evidence and the use of video links to improve the justice process for older people. Within this report, there were also genuine concerns about the length of time a case has taken to get through the court system. The reintroduction of the visible neighbourhood policing teams is a welcome move within our local communities. As local officers, 
being dedicated to specific areas of work and get to know the local residents, including the elderly generation. The established rapport and trust with the local community, including residence groups, community hubs like men's sheds, luncheon groups, including churches and across the voluntary sector. Visible police provides reassurance to the law-abiding public and also help deter criminals. The PSNI needs to focus more on how they deal with crime involving older people and the need to follow up on crime, dealing with victims of con men and contractors that was been mentioned earlier by previous speakers. I recall one recent local incident when con men co contractors got access to an older lady's home within my own constituency. They conned the victim to pay them cash for work and while distracted, the con men helped, it, helped themselves to vulnerable items in the home. Follow-up action by PSNI, including fitting, fitting additional security measures and advice on checking identity of visitors to the elderly person's home. Older people can also easily fall victims to scams, from telephone calls to direct mailing, all of whom often target vulnerable people. It is crucial that our older population have greater confidence in all the relevant agencies, including the PSNA, the PPS, and the court system going forward. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, and the quality was not constrained in any way by the quantity, so well done. I call now the Minister for Justice to respond. This is Naomi Long, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I uh, pass on my gratitude to the members for North Antrim, Andy Spellfast, for bringing this uh, motion before the House today, and I'm welcoming the opportunity to respond. Can I also congratulate the two members who gave their maiden speeches um, during this debate? I think there's no more important issue that they could have chosen um, to address the House. I would also like to thank the Commissioner for Older People for conducting the first piece of research into crime um, in Northern Ireland from the perspective of older people and those who support them. Before responding in detail, I want to reassure members that work on the recommendations in the Commissioner's report is already being progressed by my officials in conjunction with other delivery partners and an initial draft action plan being produced. More generally, I very much welcome the report and understand the importance of hearing those voices firsthand so we can further refine and strengthen service provision. With that in mind, my department has previously undertaken similar work in relation to a range of victims, looking at the experiences of those most affected by crime and which has informed policy development within our criminal justice organisations. The Commissioner's report highlights the importance of hearing the voices of older people in terms of their journey through the criminal justice system and challenges us to develop policy and implement changes to further improve older people's experience. That's a good thing as it ensures the right questions are being asked of government and that collectively we're all working together to achieve the best possible outcomes for victims and witnesses. While the focus of this motion is on older people, it is important to remember that many of the changes that we as a justice system are bringing forward will benefit all victims of crime, regardless of age. System changes should benefit all with a focus, as need be, on those who are particularly vulnerable by virtue of their circumstances. With older people currently defined as anyone 60 or over, it is also important to recognise that not all older people are vulnerable, while there are also unique challenges for some older people. In fact, as Sinead Bradley highlighted quite rightly, many older people may be quite offended to be viewed or treated as vulnerable. To assist those that are victims of crime, my department currently provides almost £1.8 million to fund services covering three core areas, offering support to almost 50,000 victims of crime annually. This includes emotional and practical support uh, services at court and also through assisting with criminal injuries compensation applications. In terms of the detail of the report, some of the key areas for my department are assessing the needs of victims and witnesses of crime, tackling delay, needs assessment, considering the outcomes of our sentencing review, progressing pre-recorded uh, cross-examination and considering what improvements may be made to data collection and communications. Before turning to the report's recommendations, let me set out some of the wider work that the Department is taking forward in that area. Whilst figures show that older people are statistically less likely to be the victim of crime, they also show that older people have the highest level of the fear of crime. What statistics also do not show is the impact that these crimes have on the lives of older people and their families, and the fear they can generate in a community, as referenced by Robin Newton and others. 
Community impact statements are one option to try and look at critical incidents which have a significant impact on a community and which can damage public confidence. The purpose is to enable that community to advise the court as to the impact that crime has had. And my officials are willing to discuss with the Commissioner how, if an incident occurs that has a disproportionate effect on older people, this can be identified and reflected in a community impact statement. This would also need to involve discussion with the police who are ultimately responsible for advising on those statements. In recognising this, the Department has also worked with the Commissioner for Older People, the PSNI and St John's Ambulance to deliver a pilot for support responder service for older victims of crime. This service launched in 2018 in two council areas in Ards and North Down and Lisburn and Castlereagh and provides immediate practical and emotional support to older people if they become victims of crime. It's designed to reduce the immediate impact of crime on an older person. The service was reviewed in December 2019 and continues to operate in the two council areas. Uptake of the service in the pilot areas was quite limited due to support provision through family and friends, which is welcome. However, consideration is being given to extending the service to at least one other council area at this time. In 2018, the Department supported the Age Sector Platform in relaunching their updated Field Safe Guide. This, continues, this contains a range of crime prevention advice to help older people keep safe, including details on internet fraud, bogus callers, elder abuse, scam prevention and information on organisations that can help older people feel safe. The Department also supports the ScamWise Northern Ireland Partnership, which aims to raise awareness of scams amongst the general public, including older people, their families and carers. The Assets Recovery Community Scheme, administered by the Department, also provides funding for projects aimed at preventing crime or reducing the fear of crime. While it's not specifically designed for projects for older people, it does fund a range of activities that involve working with older people. Addressing the fear of crime was raised by Catherine Kelly um, in terms of her contribution. The Department works very collaboratively with our uh, network of policing and community safety partnerships, the private sector and the voluntary and community sectors. Policing and community safety partnerships have a legislative duty to address crime, fear of crime and antisocial behaviour, and to do so by engaging with the local community. In addition, uh, they include the, their initiatives include the support of neighbourhood watch schemes, um, and there is a high level of awareness raising and educational activity aimed at delivering key messages on crime prevention and particularly home security. In 2018-19, PCSPs provided support for 778 accredited neighbourhood schemes active across Northern Ireland, covering over 41,933 homes with 996 volunteering coordinators. An example of current PCSP initiatives is the Belfast Home Security Service, providing home security equipment and services to people who have been recent victims of domestic burglary, and also to older people who feel vulnerable about becoming a victim of crime of that nature. The service is generally aimed at people over 60 and others at risk of becoming victims. This project specifically targets three categories of individuals, including those who have been a victim of burglary, to help them feel safer in their homes if they're over 60 years of age or at risk of harm. PSNI Crime Prevention Officer undertakes an assessment of the house, making recommendations for security equipment to be installed as required. When the successful contractor is fitting the equipment, they also advise of the other relevant support services for the person. Turning back now to the Commissioner's report and considering its recommendations, I look forward to continuing to engage with partners in the statutory, community and voluntary sector to ensure that the needs of older people are appropriately considered in reviewing, the cur uh, in reviewing current and bringing forward new services. With respect to the work that is ongoing in terms of considering the recommendations in the report, it is being progressed with my officials with an initial draft action plan having been developed. As Mervyn's story rightly identified, it is important to recognise that it's not within my department's gift to deliver on all of the recommendations. Many will require collaboration with other delivery partners and with criminal justice in other sectors. And so my officials will be meeting with the Commissioner's Office to discuss our response to the report before we formalise the action plan. Today, I want to focus, though, on the recommendations which do relate to speeding up the justice system, needs assessment, sentencing and pre-recorded cross-examination. Speeding up justice is just one of the big challenges facing the justice system, and it is a priority for the department, its justice partners, and the Criminal Justice Board. 
The speed that cases progress matters to victims and witnesses, their families and their communities, and can help offenders to better understand the implications of their actions and create a better opportunity for rehabilitation. Reducing the time it takes to complete criminal cases is challenging and complex, but, and reforms will take time to embed for their impact to be seen. But it is crucial to building confidence in the justice system, as rightly highlighted by Paul Frew and Rosemary Barton. Reforming committal proceedings is regarded as one of the key ways in which we can speed up Crown Court cases. That's why the restored executive included it in its list of priorities and new decade, new approach. I know the Commissioner is keen, like many others, to protect victims and avoid the potential trauma of committal hearings and victims having to give evidence in court twice. A draft committal reform bill is now at an advanced stage, and I hope to introduce it before summer recess. As well as abolishing oral evidence from victims and witnesses at committal hearing, the bill will pave the way for more fundamental reforms, which will see certain types of cases directly committed to the Crown Court without the need for a traditional committal hearing. In the longer term, the Department's aim is to eradicate the committal process entirely for Crown Court cases. Statutory time limits are also referenced at Recommendation 19 of the Commissioner's report. The intention to introduce these for youth cases was previously announced by the former Justice Minister David Ford in 2012. In reaching that decision, the Minister considered three independent reports on the criminal justice system, the review of the youth justice system in Northern Ireland, the review of the Northern Ireland Prison Service and the Criminal Justice Inspection Progress Report on Avoidable Delay. All three highlighted delay in processing criminal cases as a significant challenge and concluded that statutory time lim limits should be introduced as a means of delivering a step change in performance in the system. The consensus across all three reviews was that priority should be given to the youth court, where cases take longer to complete on average than in the adult magistrates' courts. I am mindful of the initial discussion regarding the introduction um, of statutory time limits was some time ago, and so it is right to consider the best approach to speeding up the system. In order to inform thinking around that and the performance of the criminal justice system more widely, the Department has developed data to measure the end-to-end -end processing times of criminal cases from the point that an incident is reported to police until the case is disposed of in court. This end-to-end -end performance data has provided fresh insight into the issue of delay and been used to identify the problem areas in the system. Of particular note is that the data has highlighted a disparity in performance between cases which are initiated by way of a police charge and those which the police report the matter to the Public Prosecution Service for a decision on whether or not to proceed with the case. This has led to the Department taking forward research into why reported or summons cases take on average longer than complete charge cases. That as a result, the Department that is working closely with the Criminal Justice Partners has been able to improve performance in certain areas, for example, in the Magistrates Court. This work will continue to be developed and further delivery performance improvements uh, will be made to inform future work on statutory time limits and the wider speeding up of justice reform programme. I want to move on now to the sentencing review. I know that a number of members have raised concerns about sentencing, including Mervyn Storey, Paul Frew and Paul Given. Recommendation 16 stated there should be further research to explore the lengths and types of sentences imposed. Ultimately, sentencing is and must be a matter for the judiciary. They will balance a range of often conflicting factors to arrive at a sentence which is proportionate to the crime and at the same time fits into the overall sentencing framework. Other factors taken into consideration will include an offender's personal circumstances, the severity of the crime and the impact on the victim which can be longer lasting for older and more vulnerable people. Liz Kimmins set out very clearly the importance of crime on older, more vulnerable people, often undermining their confidence to continue living independently. While it's natural for victims to want to see offenders punished, the experience from talking to victims is their focus is often more on stopping offending happening and having fewer people experience similar hurt. It's important that, that offenders are held to account for their actions and that sentencing deters others from committing offences. However, to reduce re-offending, it's important that problem-solving justice is applied, looking beyond the offence and finding the causes behind it. That holistic approach, tackling the underlying causes, shows that the international evidence um, is that future crime and the number of victims can be reduced. Work is, can, uh, is being taken forward in this area, including around substance misuse and domestic abuse, to break the cycle of offending behaviour. It's particularly important given the evidence that short-term custodial sentences are not necessarily effective and often result in further criminal behaviour. 
As I mentioned domestic abuse, I just want to turn to the remarks made by Doug Beattie and Olea Flynn um, about domestic situations. I appreciate people have real concerns about the abuse of older people in a care or family setting. The new domestic abuse offence that I will shortly be bringing forward will include instances where an older person is subject to domestic abuse by either a partner or family member. It would apply in cases where children or grandchildren, including those over the age of 18, abuse a grandparent. And so I think that it's important that that is included as part of the domestic abuse bill. We also need to look at opportunities for rehabilitation and for some form of recompense or restoration to the victims. The public consultation, as you know, on sentencing review in Northern Ireland has closed. As things stand, sentencing guidance requires the courts to look at the vulnerability of victims as any crime of an aggravating, as an aggravating factor. We need to look um, at whether additional um, issues need to be taken into consideration in that regard, and we are open to that uh, discussion. Finally, if I can just mention briefly needs assessment, it is important that we identify the needs of victims and that we better support them through the system, which is often one that is alien and strange as it's people's first um, passage through it. And finally, on pre-recorded cross-examination, uh, which was raised by a number of people, it is an important measure um, that has yet to be introduced, but I believe will make a considerable difference in terms of reducing the impact of going to court through cross-examination taking place ahead of the trial and without the presence um, of uh, the accused. I want to thank all of those who have participated in the debate today, and I want to reassure people that we intend to take this important work forward. I particularly value the advice and input of the Commission in terms of how they challenge all of us to improve the services delivered to older people. And as we go forward, the Department will work closely with the Commission to deliver recommendations to be addressed through the Action Plan. I look forward to the continued support of members here today as we work together to create a safer and shared community for everyone. Thank you. I call Ms Joanne Bunting to wind on the debate. As the Minister has just said, I too am grateful to, have, uh, to those who have participated and for the tone and unanimity we have adopted in this debate. I think it is reflective of the seriousness and the sincerity with which we approach this issue. So just briefly, I am going to summarise the key events as I, as I took from the debate. Mr Storey opened the debate, uh, reminding us of the inspiration that our older generation is to us. He gave us some stark some stark and all thought-provoking uh, statistics, some of which are incredibly worrisome. Mr McCann intervened to talk about the excellent existing organisations in our communities, and, and on that he's absolutely right. My colleague Mr Newton uh, spoke about fear. A number of members spoke about fear, and the fact that it permeates beyond the neighbourhood. It reaches the family. It reaches beyond the individual. And I, for one, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not ashamed or afraid to admit in this House and to this House that I live in fear of harm coming to my own elderly mother and, worse still, by someone's hand. It has already happened. There were circumstances where a man came to her door, forced his way in and insisted that she had an issue with her roof. He repeatedly came back for more money, leaving her afraid to come downstairs to open her blinds, to open her door, and to leave her home. Ms. M Ms. Kimmins spoke about uh, those who go into residential care after a burglary. This is exactly what happened to my gran, and as with Ms. Kelly, entirely reflects and mirrors my own experience, whereby my grandmother was burgled, they locked her in her room, they actually took out a full window. And once it happened once, it happened twice. We don't know if it was the same people, nobody was ever caught. But with that came her decline and her entry, entry into a residential home. Ms. Kimmins also mentioned those who are known or in a position of trust are often the perpetrator and the fear of repercussions of reporting. And those are key issues that a number of mentions, a number of members referred to. And also, just on that point, it would be remiss of me, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, not to congratulate the mem both members on their maiden speeches this morning. Ms Bradley mentioned loneliness, a key factor in this entire debate, loneliness and isolation. 
she reminded us that this whole conversation is not just about the elderly, but also about the vulnerable. She also referred to the barriers to reporting, the embarrassment, the issue of uh, memory recall, and how all of those things are off-putting to those advancing in age. Mr McHugh intervened and spoke about isolation. Mr Beatty rightly stood and kept the focus on the victim. He gave us shocking statistics about the prevalence of abuse. And those are sobering thoughts for us all to continue with in the course of our work in this place. Ms Armstrong raised an emotive story of the impact of theft. But she's right when she says we must be careful to ensure that we do not uh, exacerbate the fear. And I'm grateful to her for raising a point about the definition of the vulnerable and vulnerability. And that is another reason why I pay tribute and thank my friend Lord Morrow for his bill, which brought up that definition. Ms Armstrong also referred to the important issue of safeguarding, and I thank her for that important point. Mr Buckley referred to the, the impressive work done by caregivers, and it's those people who afford many of us the opportunity to continue working to provide for our families whilst caring for an elderly relative and loved one. Mr Given, along with many others, referred to the trauma after an event. He spoke of sentencing and the importance of a consistent approach to those who are vulnerable. Ms Flynn rightly raised the issue of, being protective, of older people being protective over their financial and personal details. And this is the issue. There is a trust and a naivety where sometimes they are prepared to give details over the phone that those who perhaps are a bit more younger and wise to scams would not necessarily give. And she rightly spoke of the devastating impact that these scams can have. Mr Frew highlighted that often the elderly are targets for criminals and raised the issue of the importance of education on safety. Mr Clark mentioned advocacy versus the sense of security through the community. Ms Kelly again reminded us that our elderly are the backbone of our society. I have already mentioned the fact that her personal experience exactly mirrored my own, and she is right when she speaks of prevention, information and support. Mr McGlone talked about our elderly deserving the right to live in peace in their homes. I wholeheartedly concur. He spoke of cross-departmental working and that good neighbours are vital. Ms Barton raised a harrowing account of a person jumping from a window. She also mentioned statistics regarding fear, as have another, a, a number of members here today. Ms Dillon raised a really important point, I felt, with regard to the old, the old and the young being brought together. It's so vital in our society, and we have so many great examples of circumstances whereby the old and the young come together and break down the barriers, the fear on one side, um, and, and the imparting of knowledge and wisdom on the other. Because oftentimes, young people will take um, a bit of advice from the elderly that they wouldn't necessarily take from their parents. Mr Dunn referred to pre-recorded evidence and video links and the importance of visible policing and the hopeful impact that that will have. To my own re remarks now, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, fairly briefly, to be the victim of crime is a horrendous thing. But how much more so for those who are older, perhaps alone and certainly vulnerable? Even the word victim is synonymous with all things unpleasant and serves to bring home our own potential frailty because anyone can be the victim of crime. That said, we take this issue seriously, not just because there before the grace of God go I, but because many of us in this room are now at that time in our lives when we are faced with caring for an elderly loved one. We are watching those who were invincible to us in our childhood become those for whom we fear and who we would protect with all we had. Perhaps to my shame, I had not read this report prior to the debate. For me, it pinpointed and crystallised what I had considered to be the issue prior to sitting for a time and empathising with those who are a bit older in our society. That is, the fear of crime and the reasons for preferring not to report, to which many members have alluded. 
What struck me was also that that which can be a lifeline can also be a threat. The telephone, also a resource for the scammer. And even things like handrails for outside steps, which to the bad guys can be indicative of vulnerability. As recently as yesterday, an elderly lady in East Belfast was burgled. Her home ransacked with money and jewellery stolen. Only a couple of weeks before that, two men entered an elderly couple's home with hatchets. Just imagine. And this is the rub, the psychological impact. The desecration of their personal safe haven and sanctuary. The ensuing loss of confidence, and it highlights their vulnerability and their mortality. The reminder that we are not what we once were. And who among us wants to face that reality? It's important we get this right. The fear of crime is debilitating, paralyzing, and can lead to isolation, which only exacerbates the problem. I'm grateful for the minister's presence, her words, her action to date, and her proposed action for going forward. And I look forward to working with her, the commissioner, the police, and the policing board towards improved outcomes. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next item on the order paper is a motion on areas of natural constraint. I shall ask the clerk to read the motion. <coughs> 